Before engineers ever built ships to cross the void, humanity had to learn how to bring life along for the ride. In the vacuum of space, there is no air, no warmth, no sound, only silence, cosmic radiation, and the certainty that a single mistake could mean death. To survive, the challenge was not just to build rockets, but to create wearable worlds. Each Apollo suit wasn't simply clothing or armor. It was a vessel, a pressure-sealed, life-supporting system designed to keep a fragile human alive on another world. This is the story of how humanity learned to become its own spacecraft. How engineers, seamstresses, pilots, and scientists together built the most personal machine ever created, the Apollo A7L suit, and how it carried explorers step by step into the history of another world. Before Apollo, there was Mercury. Before Mercury, there were high-altitude pilots venturing into air so thin that their bodies could no longer function. The first pressure suits were created not for astronauts, but for pilots flying aircraft like the U-2 and X-15, pressing the boundaries at the edge of space. Above about 7,600 meters, or 25,000 feet, a person loses consciousness from hypoxia within minutes. At the Armstrong line, 19,000 meters, 62,000 feet, unprotected body fluids begin to boil due to low pressure. Early suits were stiff, heavy, and primitive, inflated shells surrounding vulnerable men. But these pioneering efforts revealed a central truth. To survive the void, a suit had to be more than fabric. It had to become a miniature spacecraft with atmosphere, thermal control, and tough structure, all wrapped around a single person. When NASA began designing for Apollo, the standard rose to an unprecedented level. This suit would have to protect its wearer on the moon, where sunlight could heat surfaces to over 120 degrees Celsius, 250 degrees Fahrenheit, where shadows dropped to minus 150 degrees Celsius, minus 240 degrees Fahrenheit, and gravity was one-sixth that of Earth. No one had ever built a system quite like it, and the people who ultimately succeeded were not those anyone expected. In 1962, NASA opened the contract competition for the lunar suit. Major aerospace contractors such as Hamilton Standard and David Clark submitted rigid metallic designs, machines that could barely allow a person to move. But a small Delaware company, ILC Dover, renowned for making women's bras and military pressure bladders, proposed something profoundly different. They believed fabric could be engineered to deliver true flexibility. Their early A5 and A6 prototypes looked crude, but they enabled movement, kneeling, reaching, walking. Apollo astronauts would not just sit in a capsule, they would need to climb, crawl, and work on the moon's surface. That required a suit that was not just a spacecraft, but a vehicle of motion. NASA ultimately selected ILC Dover, who would partner with Hamilton Standard for life support hardware. What followed was a race within a race, a push not only to reach the moon, but to develop a machine a human could truly inhabit. From the outside, the Apollo suit appears simple. White fabric, metal rings, a golden visor. Beneath that surface lay up to 21 layers of complexity, 
arranged for pressure integrity, insulation, and durability. At its core was the pressure bladder, a sealed membrane maintaining pure oxygen at 25.5 kilopascals, or 3.7 pounds per square inch, just enough to breathe, low enough to allow movement. Surrounding it was a restraint layer woven from dacron and nylon to prevent ballooning, essential to keep the body mobile. Thermal insulation layers of aluminized mylar and capton reflected heat both in and out. Finally, the outer Teflon-coated beta cloth provided abrasion resistance, thermal reflection, and fire immunity. Each joint used convolutes, accordion-like folds that flexed while keeping the inner environment sealed. Rotating bearings at the shoulders, wrists, and waist granted axial freedom. Inside, a liquid cooling garment, crisscross tubing and chilling water, constantly drew off excess body heat through the suit's backpack. Without active cooling, astronauts would quickly overheat inside their sealed spacecraft. Even the gloves were technical masterpieces, pressurized with restraint layers and custom molded for dexterity. Note, operational Apollo gloves did not include fingertip heaters, though these were prototyped. Together, the suit and PLSS weighed about 82 kilograms, or roughly 180 pounds on Earth. On the moon's surface, the weight dropped to about 14 kilograms, or 31 pounds, still cumbersome, but manageable for lunar gravity. Every gram counted. Every system was vital for survival. Mounted on each astronaut's back was the PLSS portable life support system. Built by Hamilton Standard, it was the beating heart of the Apollo suit. Compressed oxygen tanks fed the suit's regulator, keeping the wearer under constant safe pressure. Cooling was handled by a water sublimator, venting excess body heat as vapor into space. Fans circulated the pure oxygen atmosphere, while lithium hydroxide canisters scrubbed out carbon dioxide. The backpack's autonomous life support system enabled six to eight hours of strenuous activity with up to 30 minutes of emergency reserve. When Armstrong or Cernan stepped onto the moon, every breath, their entire private ecosystem, traveled with them, packed into a box the size of a suitcase. It was a portable world in a place that had never known life. Walking on the moon wasn't easy. Every step was a carefully coordinated effort against suit pressure and inertia. But compared to earlier Mercury and Gemini suits, the Apollo A7L was an extraordinary leap. A three-layer bearing at the waist allowed twisting. Shoulder rings rotated for tool work. Knees could flex up to 90 degrees. Although running was impossible and climbing awkward, astronauts could kneel and recover from falls. Every increase in mobility was hard-earned, achieved through relentless design, test, and refinement in NASA's vacuum chambers and simulated zero gravity. Mobility under pressure was a feat of painstaking engineering. The Apollo suit underwent exhaustive trials never seen before in garment development. Vacuum exposure, thermal extremes, drop tests, and tragically, accidental fire. On January 27, 1967, during a ground rehearsal for Apollo 1, a pure oxygen atmosphere 
at 16.7 PSI ignited a fire that claimed the lives of Gus Grissom, Ed White, and Roger Chaffee. This was more than four times the flight suit's operating pressure. NASA responded with urgent redesigns. The suit's outer layer was switched to Teflon glass fiber beta cloth, and flammable materials were banned from the inner layers. Every seam, zipper, and connector became a matter of life or death. In human spaceflight, as Apollo proved, perfection is not optional, it's mandatory. Behind every Apollo suit was a team, and crucially, the hands that built them. ILC Dover's seamstresses stitched bladders and restraint layers by hand, following blueprints with sub-millimeter precision and working under constant inspection. They called themselves the human machines, producing thousands of critical stitches in every suit, estimated well into the tens of thousands, with no two suits exactly alike. Custom tailoring ensured that every joint, bearing, and panel matched its astromot. Each crew member's suit was unique, and only one-of-a-kind spacecraft left Earth. When Neil Armstrong stepped onto the lunar surface in July 1969, he didn't just make footprints, he commanded a spacecraft tailored to his every move. Within that shell of fabric, metal, and technology, his suit maintained terrestrial living conditions. Oxygen to breathe, temperature stabilization to survive, pressure to hold the human body together. Armstrong, Aldrin, Shepard, Cernan, all traversed the moon not in armor, but in individual microenvironments of their own making. Each lunar EVA was a balance of life support, mobility, and engineering. The Apollo 15 to 17 missions introduced the enhanced A7LB suit with an added flexible waist joint and improved mobility, supporting up to 22 hours of lunar surface activity. Astronauts returned with lunar dust embedded in every fold, regolith so abrasive it challenged suit seals. Yet none failed catastrophically, each suit delivered its wearer home. After Apollo, NASA looked to new missions, Skylab, Shuttle, Artemis, the design principles of A7L endured. Modern EVA suits, such as the shuttle's EMU and Artemis's XMU, still rely on cooling garments, life support packs, and layered construction pioneered for Apollo, though their hardware now differs greatly. Though materials and electronics have advanced, the core requirement has not changed. To live in space, a human must wear a spacecraft. Today, each Apollo suit rests in quiet preservation, joints locked, fabrics aged by ancient journeys. But once, they held oxygen, breath, and heartbeats. In a very real sense, they were personal planets, a portable fragment of Earth carried into the unknown. Rockets and engines claimed the spotlight in space history. But perhaps the greatest spacecraft ever built, the most intimate, the most vital, was the one made for a single soul. Before humanity could conquer space, 
it had to learn to conquer the void within. In those white suits, stitched by hand and animated by courage, we discovered a way to carry our world wherever we dared go.